Good morning at long last, folks. Sorry about that delay. Um, changing careers and all that finally caught up with me. And if I sound kind of stuffy, I just had a little allergy fit and sneezed about a bazillion times. Um, anyway, as I said, I'm finally at long last changing careers. I'm getting out of customer service for basically the first time in my life. I started at 14 with a um, working a local paper route, you know, yeah, yeah bike and everything. Um, and paid for, I mean, it's, no, I didn't, I like that. You know, I paid for a trip to Europe from, you know, from having that job and bought my first car with the money I made doing it. Um, let's see, outside that, I've worked, uh, worked in kitchens at schools. I've substitute taught. I've, uh, I've worked in a grocery store. I've worked in hotels. Um, you know, I know every job you have to deal with people, but, Man, 20 years of customer service finally just ate at me too much. And I'm finally, I suppose, blessed, I'd say, to have an opportunity to get, yeah, to try something else and, you know, have a real career. Like for just the first time in my life, I'm going to be making enough money to actually, like, live. Like if I, you know, keep going with this company, I can maybe afford a house someday. Um, I can afford a new car. Um, and that's, I, 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 it just feels so good for once. Um, cause I'm going to be making twice as much money as I am now. Um, you know, it's going to be even kind of nicer. It's going to be a management position. It's, it's lower level management, but you know, for once in my life, I guess on an employment level, someone thinks I'm finally worth something and I, I just can't be happier about it. Um, let's see, anyway, moving on here. Uh, uh, next item on the docket for um, those who've kind of been following my original series, uh, Noble Monsters slash Gods of Elfin Man. Um, I do have some news there as well. Uh, after uh, yeah, long talks and lots of running around in circles and trying to piece together what ideas work and what ones don't and... You know, I'm sure making him go totally insane. Um, I finally have decided on a proper plot line for the series and am in the process of outlining it. I'm going largely with quite a lot of the input from uh, my best friend, Taylor. Um, and just want to say thanks for putting up with me, man. I wouldn't... Um, I'm not going to give too much up front here with what's coming. Um but what's already been posted, that first little part that is canon, but it's now just, um, it's a smaller part of, um, a bigger chapter now. So, um, an updated version of that will be coming along soon. Um, for AHP fans, it is largely going to follow actually like a lot of AHP's story arc. Um, there are, there will be some thematic changes and obviously I'm taking out all the Harry Potter stuff, um, you know, but it, um, like there will be the, you know, the main protagonist will be, um, um, it will be a girl, um, as with, uh, Adventures Harry Potter. Um, it's going to be a bit closer to high fantasy than Harry Potter was, um, I guess I'd like to call it middle fantasy if that term hasn't been coined already. Um, I don't know. I don't really follow the technical details on terminology and stuff like that. I mostly just kind of like writing the stories I think are fun and interesting. Um, so with that said, please stay tuned and more, uh, yeah, more gem will be coming soon. Now moving on to the last item now that's all of the way on to the AHP stuff which is again I'm sure why most of you are here um, I do have to confess there's been an unintended side effect here with uh, reading these out loud and recording them is um, just how much I hate my early writing <laughs> I I read this stuff and like I'll get new readers will be it'll, like be reading your one and going it's so good and I'm reading through this I'm going this was so awful and I know, you know, I know we all writers and, you know, creative people were always our own worst critics, but, um, like I just, 
particularly dialogue, I find myself going like, how did I think this sounded good? Um, so I've really been battling with myself whether or not to change it. So I think I finally decided that, I don't know, we'll see how this one goes. Maybe chapter five here will feel different, but I'm really kind of toying with the idea of upgrading HP again to an ultimate edition. Right now I'm consider it the quote-unquote definitive edition. Um, but I did finally get the program back uh, Grammarly, which was a big help, so I've been um, I have been working on year three, updating that and getting ready to post the uh, um, the quote-unquote definitive edition of that. Um, but really I'm just kind of thinking maybe I'll try as I'm reading through and recording um, you know, further chapters of year one here. If I come across something I really don't like, like I just really hate the way I worded it, and if it's something I think could have and should have been worded better, I think I might just go ahead and do that. I read off of the uh, all the original documents, so I can just make, um, make the changes and then copy and paste it into, um, you know, DeviantArt and Archive of Our Own and fan fiction and all that and you know just upgrade them right from there um and see again I'm, I'm not entirely sold on doing that yet um but we'll yeah we'll we'll see how chapter five goes here um and i don't know maybe if you you all in the comments you know if you have any thoughts on that or anything along those lines um if you'd like a you know, if you'd like to, to hear, you know, a more updated version, um, more in line with my current style that I found that I enjoy, um, yeah, um, I guess, yeah, please let me know. So, anyway, with all that finally out of the way, wow, I, almost 10 minutes here. It's This is one of my longer intros I've had for a while. Um, yep, with all that out of the way, let us please move on with The Adventures of Harry Potter, Year One. Chapter 5, Kettles and Questions One can inflict pain on another person in many ways, some with anger, hatred, or with violence. In one of life's great ironies, the most overlooked of all the methods is neglect. Few things cause as much hurt as the desire of acknowledgement unfulfilled. General retired Jigme Dorji Wenshuk by the end of Harriet's first week at Hogwarts, the best that could be said was that it went quickly. Despite her hopes, things did not improve as it went along. Classes just proved just as challenging to find at the end of the week as they did at the beginning. The rest of the classes didn't go as smoothly as she'd hoped either, but not poorly. After their first three courses of History of Magic, Transfiguration, and Herbology, they next had Charms, Defense Against the Dark Arts, and Astronomy. Charms did turn out to be rather enjoyable. Harriet at least found she enjoyed Professor Flitwick, who seemed to have the intelligence of Professor McGonagall, but combined it with the cheery nature of Professor Sprout. He also appeared rather excitable. Indeed, he fell off his chair with a squeak when he read Harriet's name off the roster as he took attendance at the start of the first class. He was very encouraging, and Harriet found herself doing pretty well in the class for just the first day. Perhaps she had not done quite as well as Hermione, but she had done at least as well as Kieran and Marcus, though somewhat better than Ronnie, Lavender, and Parvati. Although, as Hermione was the best, she got Ronnie's grumbling ire, not Harriet, something that comforted Harriet in a way she knew she would never admit to Hermione, even if she did manage to become friends with her. After charms, Harriet had been looking forward to defense against the dark arts. That was until Professor Quirrell started teaching. Harriet wasn't sure exactly how Quirrell had gotten the job, and neither was anyone else after the first lesson. According to Fred and George, the last class he taught had been astronomy, but he'd taken some time off and traveled the world last year before returning and putting in for a defense against the dark arts. He was given the job, as apparently he'd been the only applicant. Aside from Snape, Fred said with a nod towards the professor that had looked at Harriet just before her scar hurt the very first night at Hogwarts. Harriet shivered looking at him again. He didn't look back at her this time, which Harriet appreciated. If it was him that made her scar prickle and hurt like that, she wasn't that anxious to experience it again. Whatever Professor Quirrell had been like as an astronomy professor, he was a complete joke as a defense against the dark arts teacher. He started with a question and answer period, 
in an attempt at bravado to talk about his experiences traveling the world the previous year. However, as the questions went on, Harry had found him extremely vague about details. For instance, he wouldn't say just what he had done to upset that vampire he claimed to have met in Romania to make him so angry that Quirrell now had to carry garlic with him everywhere he went, just in case. And after Hermione pointed out that garlic didn't actually stop vampires, it was merely an allergy they could overcome with exposure and time, he changed the subject quickly to how lovely the color of their textbook was. The subject was then changed to his turban, which Parvati said she could tell was made of fine silk and had to be very valuable. Quirrell beamed, and his stutter sl- slightly lessened as he explained how he had received it as a gift from a shaman in an African village after Quirrell had vanquished a zombie for them. Though again, when Seamus eagerly asked for details about this, instead of answering, Quirrell quickly started talking about the weather before setting them to reading their textbooks quietly for the rest of the hour. This seemed to greatly annoy Hermione, who had apparently already read and memorized the entire book, so Quirrell gave her an essay to write for extra credit instead, which seemed to cheer her up. The less than thrilling Defense Against the Dark Arts class was made up for Wednesday night to early Thursday morning by astronomy. This course was taught by the very pretty blonde witch that Harriet had seen talking to Hagrid at their very first meal in the Great Hall after the sorting. She was relatively new to the job, as she had been hired to replace Quirrell when he went off when he went off on his tour of the world. Even more interesting about Professor Sinistra, to Parvati and Lavender at least, was that she was American. This caused considerable delay in getting the class started as per- Lavender and Parvati immediately began pelting her with questions about life back home. She did at least admit to having twin daughters who were slightly younger than them, but all but deflected most personal questions and soon had them staring into telescopes creating their star charts. Harry had found astronomy quite interesting. It nurtured something deep in her as she looked out into the vastness of space, an adventurous feeling. Like she wanted to see them up close someday, not just tiny little points of light in a telescope. At the end of class, Professor Sinistra looked over their star charts. She gave Harriet very high marks on hers and a warm smile that caused Harriet to blush, and then blushed even more at her embarrassment over blushing in the first place. After class, they all grumbled sleepily as they filed back to their dormitory. Ronnie groaned with glee that their classes would be in the afternoon that day, meaning they could sleep in. Harriet, Parvati, and Lavender all agreed, though Hermione's only response was yanking the curtains shut on her four-poster bed after turning out her oil lamp. The other four girls all suspiciously looked at each other. They had all tried to talk to her during the week, trying to get her to lighten up, but she patently refused to speak to any of them. Harriet was sure she'd heard Hermione crying late the night before but she had still been too unsure of what to do about it. Harriet changed into her night clothes, which she now self-consciously did from behind her curtains, and wished the other girls good night. They returned the wishes, and they all climbed into bed nearly in unison. As she lay in bed, Harriet lay mulling over all that had happened in that week so far. She had made some of the first friends in her life, and possibly enemies, Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle, She'd gone through all her classes so far, except for potions, which she would have Friday, and was not particularly looking forward to. And she was still unable to break through to Hermione, who had been opening up so much earlier in the week. Harriet sat upright at a noise from outside her bed curtains. She listened carefully, trying to figure out what it was. All she could hear now was Ronnie's slow breathing, and no other beds were moving, so evidently it had not woken anyone else. Finally, she heard it again a barely muffled sob. With a sinking feeling, Harriet knew precisely who it was. Stealing her courage, Harriet finally slowly pulled aside the curtains and slid out of bed. She quietly followed the sniffling right to Hermione's bed curtains. She took a deep breath and whispered, Hermione? The sniffling stopped at once, and she was answered with silence. Harriet gave a carpet-muffled foot stomp of frustration. Hermione, come on, I just want to talk. Finally, Hermione pulled the curtain back. She had definitely been crying, and she was holding the picture of her parents in her hand. Harriet felt her heart sink even more. Oh, Hermione, she said softly as the other girl wiped her watery eyes. Harriet sat on the edge of the bed and hugged Hermione tightly around the shoulders. Hermione didn't say anything in response, merely hugged Harriet tight back. Harriet looked around a little anxiously before she slid onto the bed more and pulled the curtain closed behind her. Hermione wiped her eyes more, and they lay back on the bed. 
Harriet let Hermione cuddle next to her, resting her head on Harriet's shoulder. As they did, Harriet felt her cheeks get a little warm, and she looked around again nervously, even though she knew no one could see them through the curtains. She bit her lip and just stroked Hermione's hair gently. I miss them so much, Hermione muttered quietly through a sob. Harriet just nodded, trying to think of something to say. Ronnie and Parvati and Lavender all get letters from home. They have parents who know this world and how to get the, and how to do things in it. They have owls. They can write and get letters whenever they want. Harriet simply nodded, chewing her lip a little. She, of course, didn't have any parents to write to, even if she wanted. And she also had that slightly sinking feeling of jealousy every time she saw the owls come flying in delivering letters. Although she supposed it might have been even harder, been a harder feeling for Hermione to have parents, people she loved but was unable to communicate with, that must have been very hard indeed. Hermione, as, well, as you know, I'm not using her for anything. If you want, we could go up to the Owls tomorrow, and you could send a letter with Hedwig if you wanted, to your parents, I mean. Hermione looked up at Harriet and shook her head. Oh, Harriet, I'm so sorry, I, I forgot you don't... Harriet quickly shook her head, too, looking serious. No, it's okay. I'm okay. You didn't upset me. I just want to help. Hermione's lip trembled, and she hugged Harriet tightly. Oh, thank you, Harriet. It means so much to me. If there's anything I can do... Harriet just rested Hermione's head on her shoulder, and again inspiration struck her. There is, actually, Harriet said with a little smile. What? Hermione asked, looking slightly apprehensive. Sit with us at lunch in class tomorrow, Harriet said quietly, and smiled a little more. Hermione looked up at Harriet with wide eyes of surprise, but but finally she slowly nodded. And don't mind Lavender, her heart's in the right place, she's just rude, Hermione said bitterly. I was going to say she just talks without really thinking about what she's going to say first. Hermione shrugged, as if to say same difference, without really saying so. Harriet fought off an eye roll before another afterthought hit her. Oh, and don't mind Ronnie either. She's just got issues she's trying to work through, but she's nice once you get through them. Hermione didn't respond this time, and Harriet looked down at her. So you join us? Hermione finally slowly nodded. Good, Harriet said with a smile and squeezed Hermione a little tighter. Hermione wiped her eyes a little and stifled a yawn, shuddering as she stretched. I think I'm ready for bed now, Hermione said now sounding genuinely tired. Harriet nodded and finally slid out of bed. Hermione climbed back under her covers, and Harriet pulled her bed curtains closed for her. She then tiptoed back across the dormitory to her bed and climbed back in, closing her curtains before getting under the covers. For the first time since their starting night, when Harriet drifted off to sleep, she had a smile on her face. Hermione was good to her word and did join them for lunch in all their classes that afternoon. Lavender was tactful enough not to mention Hermione's hair, Ronnie didn't talk to Hermione much, but she was at least civil throughout. The boys, in particular, seemed very pleased that Hermione was joining them, and even Neville seemed emboldened, and voluntarily sat with them, though he still asked if it was all right if he did, which of course it was. After classes were over, Harriet and Hermione both searched for the Owlery and finally found it, where Hedwig happily took off, despite the somewhat hefty letter that Hermione was sending, seemingly glad to have a mission at last. Hermione was slightly embarrassed to note the roost of school owls with the sign for student faculty use, meaning she could have sent a letter whenever she wanted. But Harriet said that she was still happy to help and happy to finally give Hedwig a worthwhile job. Hermione thanked Harriet over and over again and ultimately became genuinely more cheerful as they made their way back down the stairs. As they did, they stopped at a door they hadn't seen before. Harriet, who was in an excellent mood by now, and feeling particularly adventurous, tried the handle. It was locked. Suddenly, Hermione froze and pulled Harriet away. Oh, Harriet, don't! I know where we are. That's the doorway to the third floor corridor. Eek! Hermione squeaked, and Harriet spun around to see what had frightened her. Again, seemingly from nowhere, the face of Argos Filch loomed into view. What were you two doing trying to get into that door? That door's off limits! he said darkly, growling down at them both. Harriet and Hermione looked at each other and immediately launched into explanations when another voice came from behind them. Harriet and Hermione turned, and Harriet felt her heart sink more. It wasn't Quirrell coming to their rescue this time. It was Professor Snape. What's going on here, Filch? Professor Snape asked, 
his dark eyes darting back and forth between the students and Filch, much as Professor Quirrell had done. I caught these two trying to get through the door to the third floor corridor. The one that's off limits, Filch declared, pointing at Harriet and Hermione accusingly. Harriet noted several odd things now. As Professor Snape looked at them, his eyes once again caught hers, but this time her scar did not burn. For another, Filch seemed far more respectful of Professor Snape than of Professor Quirrell. Professor Snape turned his black, fathomless eyes back to Filch. These are first-year students, Filch. They're not smart enough to know any better. You two, get back to dinner at once. Professor Snape barked, and Harriet and Hermione didn't give it another thought. As they ran off, they didn't hear Filch arguing with Professor Snape as he had with Professor Quirrell, either. I thought we were going to get detention for sure, Harriet said, stopping to catch her breath once they got to the ground floor. Hermione shuddered at the thought. I thought we were going to be expelled, she said breathlessly. Harriet grimaced as that thought took her over, too. Why didn't Snape punish us? He's supposed to hate any student but his own, Harriet asked incredulously, remembering Percy's remarks about him, as well as other dire warnings from older students like Fred and George. Despite Ronnie's warnings, the two of them seemed to be rather reliable sources of information for her. Harry didn't know why, but something about that exchange made her reluctant to repeat it to anyone, and Hermione agreed as they made their way back down to the Great Hall. They sat with the usual crowd, though Harry had found herself unable to keep from stealing glances up at Professor Snape as he came in and took his seat next to Professor Quirrell. Harry didn't know what it was, but yet again, as she watched Professor Snape, she felt her scar prickle, though it didn't hurt like it had the first night. It was an odd sense of foreboding, and Harriet didn't like it. It felt like a warning. She resolved that potions would be the only class she would not screw up in, and with that, as they got into bed that night, Harriet turned her oil lamp on low, got out her potions book, and started to read. The only thing that was good about Friday, it turned out, was the letter Harriet got from one of the school owls that morning, Hedwig still having not returned from delivering Hermione's letter. It was from Hagrid, inviting her to tea that afternoon at three. Ronnie immediately volunteered herself to go along, too, though Hermione seemed reluctant but agreed when Harriet asked her. Parvati and Lavender, on the other hand, patently refused. Harriet sent back a yes, please with the owl and felt some joy that she had at least to look f that she had that at least to look forward to. It was good she did because potions class turned out to be one of the odder experiences of her life. She couldn't call it bad, but she most definitely could not call it good. Frustrating would have been a perfect word for it. Not so much for the subject itself, but because of Professor Snape. They made their way down and unfortunately wound up behind the group of Slytherin students they would be taking the class with. The Slytherin students all gave smug smirks over their shoulders at the group of Gryffindors walking up behind them. Harriet felt herself fil being filled with even more dread at how this class was, this lesson was going to go. As Harriet watched them, the thin figure of Draco Malfoy was visible between his goons, Crab and Goyle. Crab smirked back at Kieran as he had on the train, and Kieran returned the dark look, and his fist clenched tighter on his shillelagh. Malfoy, however, had eyes only for Harriet when he stole his glances. However, it wasn't Malfoy that was rankling Harriet at the moment. What's that tacky little thing Potter has in her hair? Pansy Parkinson asked with a laugh as she gave Harriet a dark smirk. Harriet felt herself blush and her head lower. Yeah, chimed the tall, blonde, slithering girl named Pixie Fanfaro. I mean, really, like anyone wants to see her face with that horrible scar. Harriet felt her heart sink as well. She once again wished she didn't have the hair clip. She worked hard to fight the urge to take it out, though felt a little reassured when Ronnie, who again Harriet was walking arm in arm with, squeezed her arm. You're one to talk, Parkinson. At least she looks like a human, not a pug piped up another girl's voice from behind there. Harry looked around, expecting to see Parvati or Lavender, but to her surprise, it was Hermione, who was glaring daggers at both Pansy and Pixie. Pixie paused as if she was going to turn back, but Pansy put a, her hand on Pixie's arm and shook her head, and instead they merely pulled stupid buck-toothed faces back at Hermione and turned with the rest of the Slytherin group as it moved onwards ahead of them. The Gryffindors were all now looking at Hermione with a mixture of shock, pride, and sympathy. What? She does, Hermione said sheepishly, her cheeks reddening. She didn't mention anything about the apparent jab at her teeth, however. Potions class was in a dungeon, and it certainly felt like one as Harriet walked inside. 
The only light came from very dim candles, stuck in iron wall candelabras and hanging iron chandeliers. The walls were lined with shelves, and all of them bore a myriad of glass bottles and jars full of preserved creatures and body parts, and bubbling liquids that she didn't dare guess what they were. The room smelled slightly acidic, and it burned Harriet's nose a little, and she wrinkled it in protest to the smell. She did notice several other students, even Slytherins, making similar faces, however. She took a seat at a table with Ronnie and Hermione. Lavender, Parvati, and Marcus were at another, and Dean, Seamus, Kieran, and Neville at yet another. Harriet immediately flipped her book open and looked around, waiting. After a few minutes, Professor Snape finally emerged from a door at the back of the room and strode towards them. Settle down, Professor Snape said, though there was no need. The only sounds being made as he entered the room was his shutting the door and his long, black, fluttering robes before he spoke. In an instant, Harry could tell that this was a teacher not to cross even more than Professor McGonagall, if that was possible. Professor Snape started by calling the roll. As he read off Harriet's name, the usual loud muttering broke out. Harriet lowered her head, but then nearly jumped out of her seat, jumped out of her chair as Professor Snape loudly snarled, Silence! Another dead silence filled the room, and Professor Snape went on with the roll call. Harriet and Ronnie looked at each other, bemused. It wasn't that Harriet liked the attention, she nearly hated it, but Professor Snape's reaction was so different to that of all the other teachers so far, it was alarming. It wasn't as though Professor Snape was upset they were muttering disorperatively. It was more like he was furious they were giving Harriet attention at all. Professor Snape finished the roll and looked out at the room. Now, this is potions. This is not transfiguration, where mere concentration and hand motions can convert something from one thing to another. This is not charms, where merely knowing incantations and wand flicks can get you by. This is potions. It is an art and a science in one. Some have a hard time believing this is magic. However, potions is one of the most dangerous forms of magic there is. Potions is a road to glory or death. You can create them to give you great power, or to bring down your enemies. Some of you have that uncommon ability to be a great potioneer. Professor Snape paused, his eyes sweeping the room one more time in a chilling way. Though I doubt it, he finished darkly. Harriet shivered a little and heard Ronnie next to her swallow. Hermione was sitting bolt upright in her chair, listening to every word with rapt attention, as if there was nothing more in the world she wanted than to be a great potioneer. Now, Professor Snape went on again. Who can tell me what potion I would create if I were to add powdered root of esphodel to an infusion of wormwood? Harriet looked around the room. Hermione's hand had shot into the air the moment the Professor Snape had finished the question, but no one else's had. Harriet slowly raised her hand as well. She remembered from her studying last night it was called the Draft of Living Death, a potion that sounded so awful Harriet didn't know how she could have forgotten it. No one? Professor Snape asked, not looking anywhere near Harriet and Hermione. Then who can tell me where I would go to find a bezoar and why I would want one? Again, Hermione's hand shot up in the air, now even waving a little. Harriet again raised her hand, though more timidly. Beside her, Hermione shot Harriet a small glance and started shaking her hand even more vigorously. Harriet felt like lowering her hand again. Though she wanted to prove she knew the answer, she wasn't sure she wanted Professor Snape to call on her, in case she was wrong, though she was sure she wasn't. Tisk, tisk, Professor Snape smirked, looking around the room, his eyes skipping right past Harriet's table. Then how about the difference between monkshood and wolfsbane? Harriet felt a little stumped this time. She remembered reading those names, but couldn't quite place what made them different. Hermione apparently could, though, as she now actually got to her feet in her eagerness to answer the question. Professor Snape gave the classroom a dis disapproving look. Powdered asphodels and an infusion of wormswood create the potion known as the Draft of Living Death. It is a sleeping potion so powerful there are only two known cures. A bezoar, on the other hand, is a stone found in the stomach of a goat. Goats eat them to help them digest food. However, once done, the bezoar develops remarkable healing qualities and will cure most poisons by simply pushing it down the victim's throat. It is one of the few things that will cure someone who has imbibed the draft of living death, along with phoenix tears. And finally, monkshood and wolfsbane are the same plant. It is also known as aconite. He paused and looked around the room disapprovingly. 
And why are none of you writing this all down? he asked darkly. Harriet rapidly snatched up her quill and parchment and started writing. She felt foolish writing the parts she already knew, but it felt prudent to do so anyway. She felt as though somehow Professor Snape would realize she hadn't as she wrote as fast as she could. After they had all finished with the notes, Professor Snape walked to the board and waved his wand. The instructions materialized on the board for their potion they were supposed to be brewing that day, which apparently cured boils, and Professor Snape told them curtly to get to work. It wasn't a terribly tricky potion, Harriet found. She and Hermione worked furiously, while Ronnie grumbled the whole time as she mixed up the number of stirs and the amount of time to boil, or how much they needed to, to powder their snake fangs. Despite all the warnings, Harriet didn't find potions all that difficult. It was a lot like all the subjects put in together. You need a concentration and imagination like transfiguration and charms, and you needed a good memory like history of magic and astronomy. About halfway through the class, however, everyone's concentration was more than slightly disrupted when Neville's cauldron melted and spilt down on the floor. Harriet saw the mixture coming and yanked her feet up off the floor. She groaned anxiously as she heard it eating away a little at the feet of her chair, hoping they would hold. Rodney hadn't been as quick, and it burned a hole in her shoe. Neville, on the other hand, who had been covered in the substance, was now himself breaking out in boils, the exact opposite of what the potion was meant to do. "'You fool!' Professor Snape exclaimed as he examined Neville. "'You added the porcupine quills before you took the cauldron off the fire. Hospital wing, now, you, take him!' he said to Seamus, who gingerly took Neville's arm and led him from the dungeon. He then rounded on Kieran and Dean, and took a point, e and took a point each from them for not having stopped Neville from doing his potion incorrectly. Harriet and the other Gryffindor started to protest, but he swept his black, dark eyes over them again, and they all fell silent at once. Continue, he said to the class at large. And looking at each other, the Gryffindors all went back to brewing while the Slytherins all snickered darkly, though predictably Professor Snape ignored them. Near the end of class, Professor Snape finally went around inspecting all these remaining students' cauldrons. And yet again, he completely skipped over Harriet's cauldron as he passed. Harriet looked at him, completely bewildered. Her potion had looked almost as good as Hermione's, and even better than Malfoy's, who Professor Snape used to demonstrate to the class the proper way the potion should look. He even, he even smiled at Malfoy before he finally dismissed them. Well, that was lousy, Harriet muttered under her breath. Hermione nodded in agreement, though the rest of their little group merely shot them dirty looks. Professor, Snape's had, Professor Snape had criticized all their potions, ex again except for Hermione and Harriet's. However, even though he hadn't looked at their cauldron, at her cauldron, Harriet had still gotten full marks for the day. And just before three o'clock, Harriet, Ronnie, and Hermione made their way down to Hagrid's hut in the grounds. Ronnie was nearly bouncing with excitement, while Her Hermione looked far from delighted. Hagrid lived right on the edge of the Forbidden Forest, which Harriet suspected was part of Hermione's fears. The giant crossbow that was propped up by the door didn't help this ominous setting. Ronnie looked at it excitedly. But Hermione shrank away a little. As they reached Hagrid's hut, Harriet stepped boldly up to the front door and knocked. Hermione gave a loud squeak and ducked behind Ronnie as a, as a lively, deep barking came from the other side of the door. Down, Fang! Down! shouted Hagrid's booming voice, and finally the door opened a crack. The broad, bushy-haired face of Hagrid peered between the crack and the door and beamed out at them all. Oh, there you are! I was just wondering when you were gonna should be showing up. Hi, Hagrid! Harriet said, though she gave the large boarhound he was holding back by the collar a slightly nervous look. Oh, there, brought some friends, eh? Marvelous, come on in, Hagrid said and stepped aside. Harriet entered, with Ronnie and Hermione in tow behind her. The hut turned out to be only one room. There was a smell of smoke and the sound of boiling water from a copper pot over the fire in the corner. Smoked hams and fresh pheasants hung from the rafters, and there was a significant bed covered in an old-looking quilt in the corner, with a little table and some wooden chairs around it. Harriet's apprehensions about Fang proved utterly unfounded. As soon as Hagrid let go, Fang buried his nose under Harriet's arm, and somehow automatically Harriet found herself hugging him around his massive neck and smiling. Even Ronnie scratched behind Fang's ears, and Hermione looked a little relieved. Have a seat, eh? Make yourselves comfortable. Hagrid said as he poured the boiling water from the kettle into a giant teapot and set out some cups and a tray of rock cakes. These are my friends Ronnie and Hermione, Harriet said to introduce her friends. Hagrid smiled down at them 
and Hermione, seeing the smile, finally seemed to lighten up entirely. Charmed, Hagrid said warmly and chuckled at Ronnie. Now you, Miss Weasley, could have spotted you out as what it, as one without even hearing your name with that hair. Got your older brother's nose, too. Spent more time chasing those twin brothers of yours from the forest? Hagrid said, tra trailing off into a chuckle. And Ronnie smiled sheepishly, glad Hagrid seemed to have enough tact not to mention her name. And you there, Hermione. Harry would have needed to introduce you neither. I heard all about you already, too. Not one of the staff hasn't been mentioning you during the meals this week. Making quite the good impression, you are. Hermione went as red as Ronnie's hair, but smiled in a slightly self-satisfied way. Thank you, Hagrid, she said, and actually reached for a rock cake, of which Hagrid had apparently taken the time. Of which Hagrid had apparently taken the name too literally, as Harriet heard this, a slight crunching noise as Hermione bit into it and winced. Harriet made a mental note to dip her cake into her tea to attempt to soften it before eating. Hagrid poured their tea and smiled, listening to the three girls' tales of their first day. When they told him about their run-ins with Filch, Hagrid scowled. That get, eh? Keep open, Dumbledore. Come to his senses and sack the evil old wart. Follows me everywhere when I'm in the castle. Same with that ruddy cat of his. Liable to introduce her to Fang if I ever get him into... or her out of the castle. At this proclamation... Harriet and, Hermione beam Harriet and Ronnie beamed at each other, though Hermione looked a little troubled again. And then this morning we had potions. It was weird, Harriet said, reflecting back on Professor Snape, seemingly pretending she did not exist. Yeah, well, you get a lot in Professor Snape's class. You get that a lot in Professor Snape's classes. Not many sides his own students as like him much, I'd say, Hagrid agreed. He is very knowledgeable. He didn't know what Neville had done wrong with his potion in an instant, Hermione said quietly. Harriet and Ronnie both shot her dirty looks. Yeah, and he took a point from Dean and Kieran each for no reason at all, Ronnie muttered darkly. Hagrid, Harriet started with a mixture of curiosity and worry. How does Professor Snape usually show how much he dislikes someone? Hagrid looked at her, bemused. Eh, why do you ask? Hasn't been bullying you, has he? Hagrid asked, his temper seeming to rise at the idea. No, no, Harriet said, remembering Dudley's tale. He just, well, he ignores me, Harriet said, feeling very foolish saying it. The looks that Ronnie and Hermione shot her at the proclamation didn't help. Ignores you? Eh, there's a right many students who'd give their ones. Uh, give their one hands for Professor Snape to ignore him, Hagrid chuckled. It didn't help Harriet's worries. I, well, it... Just, even if it was criticism, he, but he didn't even look at my potion. He just walked straight past from Ronnie to Hermione. Ronnie was now furrowing her, furrowing her brow, as if trying to remember. Hermione suddenly had a look of comprehension. You know, I did notice that, Harriet, she said thoughtfully, and Harriet felt a little relieved. Hagrid didn't answer, merely poured them all more tea. As he did, Harriet finally noticed a piece of newspaper on the table, too, the word Gringotts jumping out at her. She picked it up as Hagrid was busy and read. It was an article from the wizarding newspaper Hagrid had been reading the day of Harriet's 11th birthday, the day Hagrid had taken her to Diagon Alley. The article apparently was about a break-in at Gringotts' wizarding bank. Harriet read on, wondering what could have happened to the person who'd broken in. But possibly nothing had happened. The perpetrator hadn't seemed to have been caught, but hadn't stolen anything either. Harriet looked back at the beginning of the article, and suddenly something jumped out at her that she'd missed the first time. The break-in had happened on the 31st of July, Harriet's birthday, the day she and Hagrid had been at Gringotts. Hagrid? Harriet exclaimed. This break-in at Gringotts. It happened the same day you and I were there. Hagrid spun around, smashing the teapot accidentally on the wall as he did. Eh? He asked, looking suddenly nervous. Oh, yeah, ah, he went on evasively. Mysterious, that... Harriet looked up at Hagrid, disbelieving. But it might have gone on while we were there. We might have seen the person who did it. Hagrid didn't answer, only busied himself with cleaning up the tea and shattered porcelain. Harriet looked at the clipping again. According to the article, the vault that had been broken into had been emptied earlier in the day. She glanced up at Hagrid, who still wasn't meeting her eye, and glanced at Hermione and Ronnie, who were looking at her curiously. Hagrid sent them off a little while later for dinner, their pockets stuffed with rock cakes they only took out of courtesy. 
Hagrid was hiding something. The article said the vault had been emptied, er, had been emptied earlier that day. When Hagrid and I went to Gringotts, he stopped at the vault and took a package out of it. It was the only thing in the vault. That must have been what the thief was after. It said Hogwarts now. Because Hagrid said this is the only place safer than Gringotts. Harriet said aloud, half to Ronnie and Hermione and half to herself. But what do you think it is? Hermione asked curiously. Harriet shrugged. No idea. Hagrid wouldn't tell me anything about it. Top secret, he said. Hogwarts business. Must be something very valuable, Harriet said, her curiosity and imagination running with her, running away with her now. And somehow, Harriet had a growing suspicion as to what may be hiding under the third floor, somewhere down the third floor corridor on the right.